Who are some of the most despicable criminals around? Let's find out, starting with... Number 5. Brick Lady Houston resident Rhoda Osman made $40,000 through a phony GoFundMe campaign after she lied about a man hitting her with a brick on the side of her head. Osman said that some guy threw a brick at her face after she refused to give him her number. Apparently, she was waiting for an Uber and approached the attacker thinking he was her driver. Osman also accused the suspect of being involved in human trafficking. Yeah, none of this really makes sense. According to one of her friends, she and Osman had gone bar hopping before the attack and had called their guy friends to come and get them. So the guy showed up in a dark colored sedan and Osman's friend sat in the front seat while Osman got into the back where another man sat. The friend said they didn't hear an argument before the incident, but said off the record that she didn't think anyone hit Osman with a brick. Osman's supposed attacker then jumped out of the car, got into another vehicle, and fled the scene. Although her friend begged her to call the police, Osman went live on Instagram to tell her followers what happened. Eventually, a detective contacted Osman to hear her version of the events. Osman said she and her friend went to a few different clubs and she called an Uber at the end of the night. But Osman mistook the sedan for the Uber and got inside. Then she said the man hit her face with the brick. Osman also told the police that she did her own research and identified her attacker as a man called Olin Douglas. But she later changed her story while talking to the detective on the phone and said the attack happened at a bar. When the detective asked more questions, she got frustrated and hung up. The police found security footage from nearby surveillance cameras and confirmed that Olin Douglas was at the scene around the time of the incident. The video also caught Osman, Douglas, and her friend entering a club. 20 minutes later, the three walked to a white Maserati that was parked nearby. A fourth man joined them and they all entered the vehicle. Osman and Douglas started arguing. He swung his hand while holding a plastic bottle and hit Osman's face. While the footage captured Osman getting hit in the face, it didn't support her version of events. A day after the incident, a GoFundMe campaign that listed Osman as the beneficiary went live. The description talked about how a man in Houston hit her with a brick because she wouldn't give him her number. After raising $42,000, donors reported the page was fraudulent and the platform took it down. The case went viral and Osman posted a video on TikTok asking users to help her hold Houston police accountable. She explained in the video that she sent the police department more than 20 emails and did their job for them since she sent them a video of Douglas confessing to the attack. Osman said she felt unsafe in Houston and needed to find somewhere else to live. She was charged with theft by deception and the district attorney sent her a bill at $50,000. Osman was already out on bail for previous charges. She agreed to surrender to police in January 2024, but never showed up. Doing things like this, lying about a crime, can have some pretty serious consequences for people such as Olin Douglas, the guy she accused. Not only is she a terrible person for setting Douglas up, but then making a fraudulent GoFundMe to just get more money is very damaging and just makes it harder to believe victims. Number four, using kids. Ohio mother Pamela Reed pretended her daughter had cancer to trick people into donating thousands of dollars for her child's recovery. For years, Reed convinced friends and family that her seven-year-old daughter was suffering from multiple rare conditions, such as acute myeloid leukemia and seizures. She shared photos of her blind and sickly child on the internet and even shaved the child's hair so the lies would be more believable. Members of the community wanted to help the family and put together multiple fundraisers as well as send Reed money to help her cope with the alleged expensive medical bills. But she couldn't keep up her lies forever. In January 2024, an elementary school nurse realized that the little girl could see perfectly, despite Reed saying her daughter had no vision in her right eye. By then, the seven-year-old had already missed over 280 school hours in the 2023-2024 school year. The concerned medical professional contacted the child's health care provider who confirmed that the little girl had never had cancer 
cancer or leukemia. Reed submitted stacks of paperwork related to her daughter's illness, but a doctor confirmed that every single form was fake. Eventually, the shamed mother admitted she falsified documents. She also repackaged prescriptions to give the appearance that they were cancer treatment medication and fed her daughter seizure medicine that she didn't need to take. The scheme began when the child was only 20 months old, when Reed claimed the little girl suffered from severe aplastic anemia, a disease where the bone marrow doesn't make enough blood cells for the body. Over the years, people threw many fundraisers for the family, which brought in thousands of dollars that Reed allegedly kept for herself. One organization donated roughly $8,000 to help with cancer treatments. The school reported Reed to the authorities, and she was arrested. Days before her arrest, she made a Facebook post claiming her child's health was deteriorating. She said they were in the middle of their biggest fight, and as a parent, nothing could have prepared her to handle such a heart-shattering situation. Reed said that her daughter was about to start 10 weeks of intense cancer treatment. It's hard to know if Reed's husband was involved in the plot. However, the couple's two children were removed from the home. Reed was charged with theft by deception, and her bond was set at $50,000. Number three, like father, like daughter. A father and daughter stole roughly $75,000 from the UK supermarket chain they both worked at without either of them realizing what the other was doing. Christopher Partner worked as a McColl's convenience store manager where he secretly stole $58,000. Then his daughter, Charlotte, was an assistant manager at another branch of McCall's where she pocketed 16000 bucks. Although the family members lived in the same house, Christopher had no idea what his daughter was doing until her employer discovered she was stealing from the company. And Charlotte its theft was what prompted an investigation into store operations, which was what uncovered her father's scam. They both ran the post office section in their respective stores. Charlotte ordered fewer stamps than she reported they were being delivered and kept the extra money for herself by a bank transfer or directly taking it out of the cash register. Christopher did the same thing, and on at least 54 occasions, he tried to pay back credit card bills as important stamp paperwork went missing. Charlotte's boss grew suspicious of her when her weekly balance sheet seemed off. And in fact, there was over $3,800 worth of stamps unaccounted for in the paperwork. When her employer confronted Charlotte about the discrepancy, she said someone must have taken the stamps to the new Milton store, another nearby McCall's location. She also said it was a mistake and was willing to pay back the funds using her own money. Her manager went to the new Milton store to see if the stamps were there, but couldn't find them. Charlotte handed in her resignation letter the next day and said the money was paid back. She later reported herself to the police. During her interview, she confessed to committing fraud over six months, starting in September of 2020. Charlotte claimed she was giving the money to a partner who was in debt in the worst way, in hint, and never touched the cash herself. McCall's investigated its other staff members and uncovered Christopher's scam. During Christopher's time as a manager, paperwork just mysteriously went missing. The court found no evidence that the father and daughter worked together and treated their actions as separate cases. Charlotte's defense painted her as a vulnerable person who was being taken advantage of by her partner. Her father's defense told the court that he was in a lot of credit card debt and tapped into the company's funds to get his finances under control. The judge sentenced Charlotte to nine months in prison, along with 180 hours of volunteer work and 15 days in rehab. The same judge handed Christopher a 15-month prison sentence. You gotta wonder what they were like when they were both arrested for the same thing. Number two, be right back. Long Island resident Steve Morrow jumped on the hood of a thief's car when the scammer attempted to drive away with his $8,000 Rolex. Morrow put his luxury watch up for sale on Facebook Marketplace and agreed to meet a potential buyer outside his home. After inspecting the Rolex, the buyer agreed to purchase it and the two negotiated a price. Morrow's first mistake was letting the thief hold on to the watch as they walked to his car so he could get the money out of his vehicle. Once the two men reached the car, the scammer jumped in, locked his doors, and closed his windows. The thief then threw threw the car into reverse and stepped on the gas, knocking Morrow to the ground. But Morrow wasn't going to go down without a fight. So he jumped on the hood of the fraudster's car like he's Zoe Bell in Death Proof, hoping it would stop the thief from driving away. It didn't. And it was what most other people would feel was his second mistake. Morrow was eventually tossed from the vehicle while the driver got away with a free Rolex. Morrow sustained multiple cuts on his knees, elbows, and hands from the incident, but was lucky that the driver didn't do any serious damage. As 
As the robber drove away, Morrow ran to some nearby police officers, which is super weird that there just happened to be some nearby cops that did nothing while this dude was getting thrown off the hood of a car and screamed at them to catch the scammer, which they didn't. As of this video, the thief has not been caught. Please remember, it's not worth risking your life for a material item, especially one valued at $8,000. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here to find out how this guy decided to wear Burberry to every bank he robbed. Number one, the master of disguise. Tyler Adams, a longtime fugitive felon, committed multiple crimes using over a dozen aliases. The FBI dubbed Adams the Master of Disguise after spending four years on the run. Adams escaped state custody in Hawaii in 2019, where he was serving time for stealing $130,000 from Hawaiian banks and shoplifting a $5,000 ring from Costco. The Oahu Community Correctional Center reported him missing when he failed to return from a work furlough. Then, in September of 2020, a judge issued a $50,000 warrant for Adams' arrest. But there was no telling how low this man was willing to go, as he previously served time for using his mother's and father's identities to rack up more than $3 million in debt. But he went lower than just stealing money. During his time as a fugitive, Adams fell in love with a woman named Raquel Sabine, who thought his name was Paul Phillips. They had a daughter together. But in April of 2022, authorities found Sabine's body in Tijuana. Residents complained that there was a a foul smell coming from Sabine's vehicle, and upon closer inspection, discovered Sabine's remains in the trunk. Mexican authorities questioned Adams about his girlfriend's disappearance, but he was uncooperative. Law enforcement later issued an amber alert for the couple's seven-month-old daughter, whom they later found safe in the care of a babysitter in Mexico. The day after his police questioning, Adams returned to the U.S. under the name Aaron Bain. Sabine's father, David Sabine, said that Adams seemed shady, and he noticed several red flags about his daughter's partner. He claimed claimed that his daughter once confided in him that Adams was much nicer when other people were around, but when they were alone, things were very different. David was confident that Adams was the culprit and claimed that there was video surveillance footage showing Adams parking Sabine's car on the street where her body was found. In June of 2022, the FBI asked the public for help locating Adams, who was probably using an alias. Over the years, Adams went by numerous names, including Aaron Lee, David Smith, Dominic Braun, David Phillips, and many more. The FBI finally tracked him down in California and arrested him, ending their four-year manhunt. He faced numerous charges, including grand theft, fraud, falsifying identification documents, and more. He pleaded guilty to misdemeanor grand theft and fraud charges. And as of this video, his case is ongoing. What are some of the most daring robberies people actually try? Let's get right to it with... Number 5. Criminal Fashion a Manhattan bank robber became notorious when he carried out his heists dressed in the designer brand Burberry, earning himself the nickname Burberry Bandit. Cornell Neely wore his designer clothing during at least two of his 14 believed heists that he conducted in April 2012. He stole over $8,500 while looking good. Neely put the money he made from the heist towards more expensive clothes, buying more Burberry shirts and a pair of sneakers costing $400. The cash was to help support Neely's shopping addiction. Neely would enter a bank and hand a note to the teller that demanded cash in bills of $50 and at $100. It was likely sprayed with cologne since Neely has an image to maintain. Neely became nervous after entering a Bank of America in Midtown Manhattan on at least one occasion and left empty-handed. Later that day, he held up a Chase branch near Columbia University and left with $500. Neely dressed casually for a crime wave he committed on April 11, 2012, where he stole $2,320 from a Midtown Sovereign Bank. It took him a month before he struck again this time at an HSBC where he swiped $724. He took $400 from an Atlantic branch six days later. Neely's stealing sprees across Manhattan made him notorious in the area. After months of not being caught, police finally arrested him and charged him with 14 bank heists. In 2014, Neely received a five to 10 year prison sentence and was released in December, 2019. However, it appeared that he hadn't learned his lesson. Between late June 2019 and July 10, 2019, 
he robbed or attempted to rob nine more Manhattan banks. On July 3rd, 2019, he tried to hold up a bank on Park Avenue, but he left empty-handed shortly after handing the teller a note. Later that day, he went to a bank on 9th Avenue where he left with $1,000. There was no stopping the Burberry bandit, except maybe a sale at Nordstrom's. Neely went on another spree between January 4 and February 29th, 2020. During that time, he attempted to rob three more banks, stealing another $3,000. Federal authorities arrested Neely in January January 2021, ending his fantastically dressed reign of terror. Shortly after, Neely was handed a 13-count indictment for his robbery spree. In his hearing in Manhattan Federal Court, Neely alleged that his actions resulted from mental illness and drug addiction. Judge Valerie Caproni acknowledged that his crimes weren't performed out of maliciousness, but were the actions of someone that needed help, but also more close. Judge Valerie could empathize. Neely apologized to those he scared during his heists and sent a letter to Caproni Prony before the sentencing, arguing that more prison time wouldn't help rehabilitate him. He argued that there were fewer good people than bad ones in jail and that he learned better ways to steal from those around him when he was in prison. The argument didn't fly, however, and Neely pleaded guilty and received a 26-month prison sentence and five years of supervised release. The biggest punishment for him was probably the crappy prison outfits. Number four, Inside Man. Two security firm employees helped stage an elaborate robbery close to London's Heathrow Airport where they stole millions of pounds from one of the company's cash and transit vans. Mohammed Sadiq and Renjeev Singh worked for Loomis when they executed the hijacking. Sadiq drove the van and Singh accompanied him as a security guard. They were transporting $8.42 million on behalf of Credit Suisse when they stopped to go to the restroom. Later, they claimed that Singh was still in the bathroom when the van drove away. Sadiq turned up hours later in a ditch with his hands tied behind his back and his feet tied together, claiming that all the money was gone. However, investigators were immediately suspicious of their story. In their opinion, Singh's behavior was far too casual for a man who was just hijacked and left in a ditch. We would have just accepted it. Oh, he's calm. Maybe he really likes being in ditches. That's probably why law enforcement stopped calling us for consults on tough cases. Well, looks like everyone at this mansion has an air tight alibi. The guy must have just tripped 47 times on a knife when the power went out. What a strange accident. Having spent 20 minutes in the bathroom, why is this called out as a long time? He went outside for a cigarette before letting co-workers in another van at the rest stop know that his truck was gone. The delay in reporting the event meant that the security firm's control center couldn't immobilize the vehicle to stop the raid. By the time they knew that the van had disappeared, someone had moved 28 bags of cash from one security van to a second vehicle parked on a quiet, secluded street. When Sadiq first spoke to the police, he told them that an unknown man had contacted him at his home. In the typical fashion of strangers suddenly appearing at your house to coerce you into committing crimes, the man threatened to set Sadiq's house on fire if he didn't participate in a plan to steal from one of Loomis's trucks. The officer was probably rolling his eyes during the story like, oh God, this again, another burning down your house threat. But investigators uncovered several pieces of evidence that showed what the pair were actually doing that day. Security camera footage caught Singh's cigarette break where he waited at least 15 minutes before letting anyone know that the van was missing. According to Sadiq's cell phone data, he was also in contact with his co-conspirators the day of the robbery and was directly involved in it. Further, Singh said he didn't have a phone on him that day despite having one in his jacket pocket that he used to speak to Sadiq while in the restroom. He threw away the phone SIM card when he arrived at the police station, which authorities then discovered and used to identify other gang members. After a two-week trial, the court convicted Singh and Sadiq of conspiracy to steal. Their ringleader was a man named Rafakt Hussein, who ran the operation and helped launder the money. His wife also participated in the fake heist. Both admitted to their involvement in the operation, which included money laundering, conspiracy to money launder, and conspiracy to commit burglary. Another member, Gary Karad, admitted to conspiracy to commit burglary in relation to the heist. The robbery was one of the biggest fake heists in the UK, and the money was never recovered. Number three, Menos por favor? Florida man Sandy Hawkins entered his local Wells Fargo and handed the teller a note demanding $1,100. When the teller asked Hawkins for his debit card, he responded that it was a robbery and he was armed. He watched the bank teller count out $2,000, which he said was too much, and specified in his note that he hoped to be caught. 
Once he had the correct amount, he left the Wells Fargo Boca Raton branch. The manager at one of his favorite sports bars identified Hawkins and helped lead Palm Beach County Sheriff deputies to his home. He confessed to the crime upon their arrival. Hawkins had lost everything. His mother and siblings had passed away, but the most devastating blow came when his wife died. At the time of the robbery, he only had $38 left and his car had been recently repossessed. Hawkins was represented in court by public defender Carrie Howitt, who asked for leniency as Hawkins had no criminal history and no living relatives. Those that knew him claimed that he was likely driven to the edge by grief, having found himself in a situation where he had barely enough money to live off and had lost everyone in his support system. Rather than jail time, Howitt fought for him to stay in a sober living facility in Delray Beach, which would be covered by grant money from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. The foundation helps reduce jail populations in Palm Beach County. Those eligible for this type of benefit are people in need of mental health care, homeless people, and people living in poverty. Hallwood's goal was to put Hawkins in a position where he could get back on his feet. She also hoped to set him up with a grief counselor. Circuit Judge Jeffrey Gillen agreed to release him to the facility. A condition of the release was that he would be put on a monitor. Hopefully, Hawkins is doing a little better. Number two, the phone plan. Inmate Arthur Cofield Jr., who was locked up in a Georgia maximum security prison, allegedly stole $11 million from a billionaire movie mogul while behind bars. Despite being locked inside the Georgia Department of Corrections Special Management Unit, Arthur Lee Cofield Jr. took millions of dollars from at least one billionaire's account by pretending to be them while Arthur was on the phone with their bank. Cofield was serving a 14-year sentence for armed robbery when he allegedly impersonated movie mogul. Sidney Kimmel. Sidney Kimmel is the CEO and chairman of the Los Angeles-based entertainment company Sidney Kimmel Entertainment. The company is responsible for misleadingly titled blockbusters like Crazy Rich Asians. Spoiler, they were not actually crazy. Everyone survives. Moneyball, no giant balls of money made out of money running over people. And Hell or High Water, the water wasn't high and there were many other choices. Sidney Kimmel Entertainment was financially backed over 40 feature films. Kimmel is worth around one and a half billion dollars and began his career when he founded Jones New York, an apparel company that he sold for $2.2 billion. In recent years, Kimmel's focused both on filmmaking and his philanthropic endeavors. The Johns Hopkins University Cancer Center was named after him, as well as the medical school at Philadelphia's Thomas Jefferson University. Cofield spoke to customer service representatives at Charles Schwab, where he impersonated Kimmel. He arranged $11 million to buy 6,100 six American Eagle one ounce gold coins from a company in Idaho. From there, Cofield allegedly used some coins to buy a $4.4 million house and had a private plane transport the rest to Atlanta. Investigators were unsure as to why Cofield targeted Kimmel, although it seemed that there were other billionaires that interested Cofield as well. Authorities believe Cofield is responsible for other thefts, including potentially accessing an account belonging to Nicole Wertheim, who was married to Florida billionaire Herbert Wertheim. Allegedly, he turned $2.25 million into gold coins as he did with Kimmel's money. Cofield maintained his presence in the outside world using contraband cell phones. Guards found him with cell phones at least 12 times while serving at five different prisons. You can't get the cell phones away from the kids these days, am I right? On one occasion, officers conducting a shakedown found a cell phone concealed on Cofield's body. He had cell phone junk if you will. Authorities believe Cofield was paying off correctional officers to turn a blind eye to his possession and usage of the banned cell phones, but couldn't prove it. However, it was clear that someone was helping him get the phones. The Georgia Department of Corrections often deals with prisoners obtaining cell phones. Inmates use creative methods to get phones, including using drones to drop them into the yard. Cell phones have many purposes for inmates, ranging from communicating with family and loved ones to being used to maintaining a connection to the outside world. For Cofield, his cell phone was his lifeline to carrying out his crimes from inside his cell. In the fiscal year of 2022, over 5,600 cell phones were confiscated from inmates. Cofield gained access to Kimball's Charles Schwab account when he called the bank pretending to be the billionaire. He used the app TextNow, which made it appear that he was calling from a Los Angeles number rather than a Georgia one. Cofield opened a new checking account in Kimball's name. When the representative asked him for a utility bill and form of ID, Cofield sent over a photo.
photo of Kimmel's driver's license and a copy of his water bill. How he got access to that information, we don't know. But how can you not be impressed? Kimmel's license. Once the account was opened, Cofield allegedly contacted Money Metals Exchange, a company in Idaho that deals with precious metals. He then organized the purchase of the gold coins. To wire money to Money Metals Exchange, Cofield gave Schwab a reimbursement request and a forged letter of authorization from Kimmel. He organized a private plane to bring the coins to Atlanta and arranged a security detail for the transaction. At least two others were involved in the scheme, Eldridge Bennett and his daughter, Aliyah Bennett. Authorities allege that Eldridge met the plane when it touched down at Atlanta Signature Airport, where he collected the coins. Aliyah was likely responsible for finding the house Cofield purchased. At the time, the house, situated on Randall Mill wasn't even for sale due to being under construction. Aliyah posed as Cofield's wife and convinced the owner to sell her the home for $4.4 million to Cofield under the name Archie Lee. They paid the majority of the roughly $500,000 down payment in cash. During closing, Eldridge took the money in duffel bags to a branch of Cadence Bank located in Alpharetta. Everyone that dealt with Archie seemed to have a strange feeling about him. He'd only meet people on the phone and go weeks without communicating, then reappear and give an excuse for not being available, like claiming he was out of the country. Cofield told the original Randall Mill homeowner that he was a talent scout for rap artists trying to make it in the music industry. Supposedly, his role required him to have large amounts of cash on hand. He claimed that he made his money by investing in Bitcoin. Sidney Kimmel didn't suffer financially from the ordeal. Thank heavens. We don't know what we would do if Kimmel suffered any sort of financial loss, so he was ultimately not the victim. Kimmel actually slept peacefully, unaware that he had some chump change stolen like the precious angel he is. Charles Schwab reimbursed Kimmel for the total amount stolen, as is their policy in cases of unauthorized activity. Once the suspected fraudulent activity was on their radar, they launched an official investigation and ensured their client's account was protected. They also notified the authorities. Federal agents uncovered Cofield's criminal activities in 2020 and charged him with conspiracy to commit bank fraud and money laundering. They believed he likely orchestrated many similar thefts from billionaires' accounts, but the theory hadn't been proven as of October 2022. The theft was likely not the only crime Cofield committed behind bars. As of October 2022, he was facing charges of attempted murder following accusations that he ordered the murder of one of his romantic rivals. Eldridge and Aliyah Bennett also faced charges for their roles in the scheme. The house became subject to forfeiture and sale by the government. Number one, Facebook Confessions. A London-based gang of eight men stole expensive luxury cars from some of the wealthiest residents in the city. They stole Range Rovers, Porsches, BMWs, and a Mercedes worth $120,000. In addition, they took phones, laptops, and jewelry in at least 15 different robberies. The group couldn't keep quiet about their newfound wealth and took to social media to brag about it. How else are people going to know that you've been stealing expensive cars unless you're telling everyone online, you know? One member took a picture of himself holding a stack of cash between two slices of bread showing off a cash sandwich. The joke is on him though, you can only get coins back if you eat them. Unfortunately, we lost all of our rent money learning that little lesson. Another member posed with a huge pile of 20 and 50 pound notes worth $24 and $60 each. Two of the gang members also took pictures with the stolen Mercedes. Police obtained video footage from their phones where they raced the cars they stole and messages they sent one another to arrange the burglaries leading directly to their arrest. Between April and September 2012, the group broke into homes in Kensington, Notting Hill, and Kensell Green, where they stole at least nine cars, jewelry, and electronic goods. They targeted houses with valuable cars and often broke into the homes just to get the keys. Kaylin Williamson, the ringleader, had pictures on his phone where he held three keys from stolen vehicles. In another photo, he was sitting on a Porsche 911 that was reported stolen by its owner. Video footage of him running from officers and accidentally accidentally dropping the key to a stolen Land Rover was used as evidence in court. Out of everything they stole, the main trophy was the $120,000 white Mercedes. Police returned the vehicle to its owner, but the gang kept the key. They tried to steal it again, but discovered it had been reprogrammed. The owner caught them on his home surveillance camera and chased the thieves away. On another occasion, the gang had to flee the scene after attempting to steal a Maserati and a laptop after the owner confronted them midway through the robbery. The group all pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit a dwelling house burglary in court, with the exception of Rory Mason, who claimed to have nothing to do with the robbery. 
However, a jury found the whole group guilty. Their prison sentences ranged from almost five years to three years and 10 months. Williamson's sentence was four years and eight months after being the brains behind most of the operation. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you'd rather have, free Arby's for life or free Wendy's for life.